Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. We are very excited to have this room full of people coming to hear Earl Shuttleworth uh, do what will, as it always is, be an amazing lecture. So welcome to the ballroom at Mechanics Hall. How many people are in this room for the first time tonight? Yes. So please come back over and over again. My name is Pam Plum. I'm president of the board of directors here at Maine Charitable Mechanic Association, the builder and continuous owner of Mechanics Hall. And we are very excited to have Earl here, our preeminent architectural historian in the state of Maine, and by the way, an advisory board member um, for Maine Charitable Mechanic Association. Um, and we are putting this on, and Earl has offered this to us so that we could put it on, so that we could begin a campaign to raise $50,000 to support our first ever executive director. First ever since 1815 executive <laughs> director. And it's really a critical thing to help us um, make the next steps forward in our organization to continue the restoration of the hall and to provide um, sort of operational stability for the organization, which has been all volunteer run um, up to this point. Tonight we have, although there are a few seats empty still, a sold out event. And that is thanks to our many sponsors who are here this evening, to whom we're very grateful, our patrons that are here tonight and our attendees. Thank you all for making this evening such a success. I particularly want to thank our event chairs, Paul and Dodo Stevens, who are right here, who have taken this on. They deserve all of that. They have done a spectacular job. This event has been more successful than we ever dreamed it could be, thanks to that energy and to the whole committee. And the committee, by the way, is listed in your program. Uh, and I recommend all of those folks for a big thank you. Um, we also want to thank our, um, our sponsors, our uh, patrons, and our community um, uh, support people who have community organizations that have helped us promote this. Uh, and those are also listed in your program. So there'll be a test at the end to see if you can remember all of these people. Um, <clears throat> So I'm really going to ask, it's my great pleasure to ask Paul Stevens, who ran this whole show to put it all together, to come and introduce Earl. Uh, he has known Earl even longer than I have known Earl, and uh, I think he's the perfect person to do it. I had the pleasure of meeting Paul at the very beginning of our time in Portland when I went to work for Greater Portland Landmarks, and Paul was already up to his eyeballs in P Greater Portland Landmarks and actually had the courage to buy for his own home the house right next door to the Howe House, which was considered a pioneer's effort at the time that Landmarks bought that building. So Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pam. I, I couldn't have done this without an awful lot of support from a lot of the people in, in this room, many, many of <clears throat> many of many of my my uh, friends and 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 all right. Thank you, Frazier. An another volunteer we couldn't have done without. <laughs> couldn't have done without Frazier. But it's it's really a pleasure to see uh, all of my friends and colleagues here tonight who helped us support support this organization. I'm going to do something a little different tonight because I've introduced Earl so many times, and and this is kind of. You know, one of those things that usually begins, this person needs no introduction. Uh, and so I guess the first question I would ask is how many of you here know Earl Shuttleworth and how many uh, know a little bit about him? Whoa, that's almost everybody. So, so, but I could stop here, but let's see how much you know. So who knows where he graduated from high school in 1966, speak up. Deering High School, that's correct. And this is a harder question, who was his favorite teacher and his history mentor in high school? Uh, Dale, Elizabeth Ring, you're absolutely right, Dale. 
So also, did you know that he's, he's a graduate of Colby, has a master's from BU, an honorary degree from Bowdoin, and an honorary degree from Mecca right across the street. He gave his first lecture in 1964 to the Portland College Club at Mrs. Edith Sills' house on Bowdoin Street. So that was quite a long time ago, given the fact that he graduated from high school in 66. So, so, but, so now, who can guess how many lectures Earl has given since? Let's try and see if anybody can come up with that number. Anybody want to guess? Pam? 2,000 plus. 2,000 plus? Anybody else? 2,500? Going once? <laughs> Going twice? Okay, I think I have it on fairly good knowledge that tonight is 2,002. <laughs> These lectures were almost all in addition to his job uh, as the State Historic Preservation Officer and the Director of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, offices which he held for over 40 years, and he's still the state historian. Uh, that's longer than any other state director has served in the country. Do you know how many buildings were nominated to the National Historic Register during his tenure? All right, anybody else? That's a pretty low number. Anybody else going to come up with a number? You guys are all way, way short, 1,600. That is a lot of buildings on the National Historic Register. And this is a really easy one. What well-known preservation organization did he help found? Okay. And that was when he was in high school. <laughs> so what famous Maine architect does he know more about than any other person? <laughs> You're right, John Calvin Stevens. And you may not know that he was a good friend of my dad and co-authored a book on my great-grandfather, one of many, many books that Earl has written. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Earl, who's been my friend since we first shared a podium speaking to students at King Middle School in 1966. Uh, I was astonished at how much more he knew about Portland architecture than I did, because <laughs> I thought I was pretty smart, because I was fairly, fairly new out of college. Uh, but over these years, how many long time, he has been my go-to person for his knowledge of main historic buildings throughout my architectural career. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my friend Earl. Well, thank you very much, both uh, Pam and Paul. Um, and I, I really want to thank you both, as well as uh, 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 Dodo Stevens, and also uh, David Clough, who is here tonight, photographer from uh, the Rockland area, who actually donated many of the wonderful period, new, new current photographs as opposed to period photographs in the talk tonight. Um, I just have a couple caveats. One, uh, if you just check your cell phones, uh, you know you do this now every time you go to the movie theater, um, just, to, just to make sure that they're off. Um, if you were before uh, a legislative committee in Augusta, there would be a $5 fine if your, if your uh, cell phone went off during the, uh, the hearing. And, you know, I'm sure that the main child mechanics would be glad to make a little side money tonight uh, on your transgressions, but uh, it would be nice not to uh, have your phone go off. Um, secondly, um, I'm just going to ask that uh, everyone hold any questions or comments that you have until uh, after the lecture, and then I'm happy to take a few minutes to try and answer any questions that you have. So we'll get started. Um, so tonight, as advertised, um, we're going to be concentrating on Thomas J. Sparrow. Thomas J. Sparrow is not your household uh, a Maine or a Portland architect, but he is a very important figure in both uh, Maine and Portland architecture in that as far as Portland is concerned, uh, he's probably the first person who actually declared himself to be a full-time architect. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, it was common that uh, the, the buildings that were being built were both designed and constructed uh, by a master. Uh, 
And in fact, with someone as talented as Alexander Paris during his brief period in Portland in the early 1800s, he was always both a, a, a designer and a housewright as well. He, he built the buildings that he designed. However, beginning in the second quarter of the, of the 19th century, you have the emergence of the American architectural profession. And this makes its way to Maine uh, with Bangor in the 1830s, the great boom town of the lumber industry, with a man named Charles G. Bryant and another named Charles H. Pond. And then about 1840, uh, we have in Portland our first full-time architect. And in the midst of his long career, he worked about 25 years here in Portland, um, he designs the Mechanics Hall and becomes a very important factor in the organization. So in any case, um, this is really the, the, the premise that we work under tonight. Um, I want to just go uh, uh, into a little bit of the background of the charitable mechanics before we start, and I'll touch on this as we go through. Um, some have already alluded to the fact that this is a very old organization. It was founded in 1815, five years before Maine statehood, uh, and it could very well be one of the oldest, if not the oldest, continuous organizations uh, in uh, Maine today. Um, the organization was created at a time when uh, there was really no safety net. And the concern was that uh, mechanics, uh, mechanics of all kinds, uh, whether you were making barrels or whether you were uh, carving fenestration or whatever you were doing in the field on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you had nothing to fall back on. And if, if something happened, so you died, so you were injured on the job. And the perp one of the main purposes of the mechanics was to provide that, that organizational fraternal safety net for its members. Another very important uh, goal from the very beginning was education. And that's still very much a part of what we do here today. And that is, uh, from the very early days, there was an apprentice library, the opportunity when there weren't public libraries for young men to, to read books on their particular trade and gain in knowledge and gain in skill and accruity. And that was another great purpose. A, a, a third purpose really was to just bring people together. And this was really why the hall was created between 1857 and 1859. It was very popular in the 19th century for organizations, particularly fraternal organizations like uh, the Masons or the Odd Fellows or whatever, to create a meeting hall so that there was a place to gather and a place to, to exchange ideas and a place to uh, enjoy entertainment. And what we have to remember about this building is that in 1859 when it opened, there was there was no radio, there was no television, there were no movies, uh, there was no internet, uh, there was no twi Twitter or anything. And, and so it was um, very common for people to create these beautiful big halls uh, for various entertainments, for plays, for traveling shows, for lectures, and whatever. And they're very rare today. And this is what makes the hall that we're in today so special, because it's a rare survivor of that um, 19th century phenomenon of the meeting hall. So these are just three basic precepts of the organization. So now let's turn to Thomas J. Sparrow, who we've been looking at here, this very uh, earnest gentleman. Uh, the original photograph of this is on the landing, the staircase landing. Uh, and he was born in Portland in 1805, uh, son of Jonathan and Eleanor um, Sparrow. Uh, his father was a wood turner. Between 1831 and the mid-1830s, young Thomas was involved in manufacturing organs. By 1837, uh, he had become a joiner, that is, a tradesman specializing in interior finish. In 1838, his name appears in a list of workmen on the Great Merchants Exchange, and we'll, we'll see that building in a moment. Uh, and by 1841, 
um, he lists himself in the Portland Directory as an architect. We believe that probably he staked that territory out about a year before. And for the next 25 years, um, he is one of the major architects in Portland. Um, during the Great Fire of July 4th, 1866, he lost the contents of his architectural office. So we have virtually no architectural plans or office records surviving. And this was not unusual. Francis Fassett and George M. Harding and other architects lost their offices as well. Um, he, however, resumed his practice with the help of a young assistant, but by July 1867, he had suffered a stroke uh, and went to live with his brother William uh, in Brownville, up in northern Maine, where he died in 1870. When word of his death reached Portland, the flag on this building, Mechanics Hall, was lowered to half-mast in his honor, and he is buried in the family plot in Stroudwater. So we're looking first at Portland from Cape Elizabeth in 1832. 1832 is an important year for Portland because it's the year that it becomes the first uh, incorporated city in Maine. Two years later, 1834, Bangor joins Portland. The population is about 12,500, and this is the wonderful fold-out lithographic plate looking from what is now South Portland to Portland from the first edition of William Willis's history. And this is the period when Thomas uh, J. Sparrow first enters the workforce, and we first find his name uh, first as a wood, uh, pardon me, as, as a, uh, a maker of organs, and then as a joiner. Now we're looking at, at, at what is probably the earliest photograph of Portland. This is a view of Middle Street, uh, looking down Middle Street, about 1844, taken by the local photographer George M. Howe. This is a daguerreotype owned by Maine Historical. And you can see that Portland, uh, it, this was Main Street, Portland, and, and what a modest uh, group of buildings this is. Uh, these little brick and wooden uh, shops, old houses that were built uh, just after the revolution, and even one or two had survived the, the, the fire that occurred at the time of the revolution. But looming over this entire uh, view is this massive granite Greek revival building called the Merchants Exchange. This was designed by Richard Bond from Boston, and it was probably one of the most ambitious uh, Greek Revival public buildings built in New England uh, in the 1830s and 40s. Um, and we find in the records that Thomas J. Sparrow was a workman uh, on this project. Um, this building uh, had a very short life. Um, it was burned in 1854, and in fact, nothing in this photograph uh, survived the Great Fire of 1866. So this is totally removing the veil of time and looking back at a view uh, of everything that is gone. Now we move to 1855 in contrast to the uh, view of 1832 of Portland. And we now find that Portland has increased uh, in population uh, to 27,500. Uh, not a little bit in, in thanks to a, a fairly sizable uh, Irish immigration in the 1840s and 50s. This is the great Smith Brothers view of Portland, again, from uh, what is now South Portland, with a ship launching in the foreground, and you can see already the peninsula is, is be becoming very well developed and very populous. This is the city 11 years before the center of the city is destroyed by the Great Fire. That this is the city in which Thomas J. Sparrow does most of his work in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. The earliest building that we know by him is this rather fascinating double house that he designed for William and John Sparrow, his brothers, at Winter and Pine Streets, uh, built in 1849. And it has a rather gothic touch to it, uh, with uh, the, the very peaked gables on the facade. Um, it's, it's a house which um, is, is interesting both architecturally and also both brothers uh, were uh, engineers at the Portland Company, which was a brand new organization created in the mid-1840s to build the steam engines and the rolling stock 
for the what became the Grand Trunk Railway, the, the great connection between Portland and Montreal. And it was a great economic driver for decades in, in Portland's life. And so you find that Sparrow's two brothers are, are engineers uh, at the Portland Company. And then, uh, about uh, five years later, William H. Stevenson builds a similar double house at State and Spring Streets, 1854. He is a cashier in the Mechanics Bank. This building is like the one we showed a few moments ago, still very much with us. Um, and it, it, it basically is the same plan, the same form uh, as the, the William and John Sparrow House, but it's a little more elaborate, a little larger in scale, and it's very eclectic. There's Greek Revival trim on the windows, there's Italianate um, uh, trim on the corners, and there's a very uh, Gothic peak uh, to the roof. And here is that building today. And relatively recently, it's, it's been restored, and uh, it's, it's looking very well. Now, in addition to um, houses in Portland, we're looking at houses first in, in our talk, um, he also worked uh, outside of the city. And again, because of the lack of, of records, we don't know a lot of what he did. But we do have uh, a very clear record on this beautiful uh, two and a half story uh, house uh, in Yarmouth, the Captain Reuben Merrill House of uh, 1858. This is on uh, West Main Street. Captain Reuben Merrill was a, a sea captain. Uh, of course, Yarmouth had many sea captains, a uh, very active port. Um, and in 1858, uh, the captain had uh, accrued enough fortune uh, to build this really quite splendid house. This is an early photograph of the house where you see the L in the barn. The barn no longer survives. And this is the house today. Um, it's actually uh, the headquarters of Maine Preservation, very appropriately. Uh, and it remains in the family ownership. Um, it's now in the fourth generation of the Merrill family. Um, I would say that, uh, generally speaking, you'd characterize it as Italianate. The trim over the windows is maybe very simple, horizontal Greek revival. But the doorway is clearly Italianate with the brackets um, supporting uh, the, the, the little balustrade. And there's that very pronounced overhang with the brackets that's characteristic of the uh, Italianate. It's a beautiful house, still largely intact. In fact, if you uh, visit Maine Preservation offices today, you will find Captain Merrill and his wife uh, staring down at you out of period portraits. So they, they've never really left. Um, now we're turning to churches that we know by Thomas J. Sparrow. And this is a long lost building. Um, this is the Pine Street Methodist Church. Um, if you go just one in from Pine Street, you'll find even today um, a, a kind of a, a little parking lot there. And this is where that church stood, right at the beginning of Pine Street. Totally Greek revival in its style. Trim over the windows, the triangular pediment in the roof, uh, the octagonal um, tower, all very characteristic. And, and in many ways, uh, this reminds one of dozens, if not even more, uh, little country churches all through Maine, built in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. But here we find it in an urban setting by Thomas J. Sparrow. And this building lasted only till the 1870s. It was torn down and replaced by a brick building, which in turn was torn down. Uh, you'll see a, a very close similarity uh, to the tower on the Pine Street Methodist Church, to the tower on the third congregational church, which is in the foreground. This is a photograph taken in 1865 uh, from the, the City Hall Tower. The City Hall at that time was where our City Hall is now. And we're looking up toward Munjoy Hill on the left, and we're looking out to the harbor on the right. And the church in the foreground, the third congregational church, um, was uh, a remodeling project of Thomas J. Sparrow in 1847-48. Uh, uh, it was destroyed in the Great Fire. 
Uh, Thomas J. Sparrow was uh, apparently uh, very much in demand for remodeling churches. Of course, the whole church culture was a very important force uh, in America at the time. And here we're looking at St. Paul's Church of 182, an Episcopal church that stood on Pearl Street. And this little building was designed by one of its parishioners, uh, Dr. Shirley Ewing. Uh, in 1839, uh, the uh, St. Paul's Episcopal Parish uh, merged into the St. Stephen's Parish, and St. Stephen's took ownership of the building. And then, in 1856, they turned to Thomas J. Sparrow to greatly enlarge and remodel what was a lovely sort of classical little federal chapel uh, into uh, this very elaborate Gothic Revival church. This is a painting of the, of the church uh, on Pearl Street. And here is a wood engraving of the church in the 1850s, a uh, very elaborate uh, facade. Um, and I think you might say that this was kind of a, uh, an Italian or uh, Lombardesque Gothic because there's quite a bit of, uh, of arches, arch motif used uh, in the windows, but also uh, the Gothic spires as well. And then, amazingly, we have, for a building that was destroyed in the Great Fire, we have interior photographs of this building taken on uh, Christmas Day in 1860. Um, and we're looking uh, toward the pulpit, and then we're looking toward uh, the, gal the choir and the organ. So, as with many of the buildings we've already encountered, uh, Sparrow's work was destroyed in the Great Fire. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, in any case, um, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a stereo view, you can get a sense of it from there, stereo view um, of what was left of the facade of that very elaborate St. Stephen's Church on Pearl Street. And then we're looking up again north uh, toward Monjoy Hill, and you can see the profile of the observatory uh, in the background. And this is a side view of the ruins of that building. So you can get a sense that all the side windows were all arched as well. Um, it, was a, it was really a major makeover uh, of uh, a much smaller earlier building. Now we're going back to another early photograph of Middle Street before the Great Fire, and we're now uh, merging into commercial buildings. Um, the building one in from the left is the Barber Block, which is one of the first commercial buildings that we know that Sparrow designed. Um, the Barber Block was built on Middle Street in 1851. This photograph uh, dates from 1863. Um, and it was built by Poor and Jos, who were merchants. Um, and they also uh, rented to a man named Fernal, who was a merchant tailor. What's particularly interesting about these, this building, there are two factors. One is that the first story is the first building in Portland to use a cast iron front. And there's a record that Mr. Jose, who was a real estate developer, and Thomas Sparrow actually went to Portland, uh, pardon me, to New York City to one of the great foundries there that was making cast iron fronts and looked at their wares and ordered this front. And I have a feeling also that the, um, the Gothic trim over the windows may be cast iron as well, the repeating trim. And then way up there on the top, you see that monitor. That monitor is really very similar in style to what you find on the roof of uh, the Mechanics Hall. Here is uh, a head-on view from an old uh, wood engraving. It's off uh, a billhead uh, from uh, Mr. Fernal. Uh, and uh, the, the building actually has been quite simplified by the wood engraver. It's not, it, it doesn't have quite the, uh, the elegance that uh, it does in the old photograph, but you get a sense of it anyway. Another of the great buildings, that um, uh, commercial buildings, that uh, uh, Thomas J. Sparrow was involved in uh, was Muzzy's Row. This was built by John Muzzy, who was a merchant and real estate developer. Uh, he, by the way, was the, uh, uh, the father of Margaret Jane Muzzy Sweat, who gave us the original Sweat Gallery uh, for the Art Museum. And in Muzzy's Row, which is this long building to the right, very similar in style to the Barber Block, cast iron front, these repeating 
um, Gothic headers on the windows. Uh, and here we're looking up Middle Street and in the background is the old city hall where the uh, soldiers monument is now and even further over is just a, a glimpse of the old Preble house. This is a view from the 1850s and again uh, both the Barber block and the Muzzy block were destroyed in the fire. But now finally mercifully we get to two buildings that are still standing, um, commercial buildings, uh, because Commercial Street was not destroyed in the Great Fire. Commercial Street, of course, was created by the city about 1850 um, as this grand scheme to uh, rebuild the waterfront and make it ready for the railroad age. Because what was happening was uh, the Grand Trunk Railway was coming in from the north, uh, from, uh, from Canada, and railroads were coming in from the south from Boston and Portsmouth. And so there needed to be um, a place for all of the, the goods, uh, large warehouses needed to be built. And also some of us are old enough to remember uh, the, the railroad tracks uh, in, the, uh, in the street, in Commercial Street. Uh, and indeed, uh, that was very much a part of it is that they, they actually the, the, uh, the, the railroad cars, uh, the freight cars would, would literally go along the street and empty their goods uh, into these great warehouses. This is a view from the late 19th century, and it shows us two of Sparrow's warehouse buildings. Uh, the one on the left is uh, the Brooks Block, and then just count over Brooks Block, the little wooden building, uh, the building from the 1880s, and then the Moulton Block. The Moulton Block is the other block uh, by Sparrow on Commercial Street that survives today. It's entirely possible that he did some other of these great blocks, but uh, we just don't have the documentation. Here's uh, an old wood engraving uh, of the Brooks Block. Uh, the Brooks Block was built in uh, 1853. Uh, it was a very handsome building, uh, very simple in many ways, continuing the Greek Revival tradition, but with Italianate trim on the sides and this wonderful fenestration for a cornice in brickwork uh, at the uh, top of the building. And this is the 1924 uh, Portland tax photograph of the building. Uh, it was still largely intact uh, from 1853 when this photo was taken in 1924. And here is the building today. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, of course, what's happened to many of the buildings in the old port. There have been uh, some additions uh, as part of the reflection of the vitality of the old port and the growth of the old port. Uh, and so we have the Brooks Block at the, at the left here uh, with its quite recent contemporary addition. But look how handsome this is with the, um, the, the, the beautiful granite first story, uh, the big openings, uh, the granite coins on the corner, uh, the fenestration for the cornice. And then shifting over to the far right of this photograph, uh, we see uh, the building we'll be looking at in a moment, the Molten Block. Uh, here's a close-up of um, the Brooks Block. Now this is the Molten Block as it appeared originally. This is a circa 1900 photograph. And it's very interesting to see that before it had that major addition of several stories in the early 20th century, uh, that it um, had this lovely hip roof and this side triangular pediment. But in many ways, it's the same theory as um, the Brooks block uh, with the first story done in granite, uh, the, the granite coins on the corners, the fenestration is virtually identical. And here's the building today. As you see, it, uh, it, it got a few additions uh, in the early 20th century. Moving on to other commercial buildings, ones that do not survive, um, if we go, uh, if we start at the right in this 1865 view of Middle Street, uh, we, we start at the right, we then go to the building with the dormers, then go to the building with the arch windows, and then the big building next to that is the Evans block from 1863, very handsome Italianate block uh, with probably a uh, sandstone or brownstone facade, as best we can tell from the old photographs. And there's another view of it. Italianate in feeling. And uh, then, then we turn to um, the Sturdivant block. Um, 
we're standing at Middle and Exchange Streets uh, in 1865. At the right, where Post Office Park is now, um, is the custom house that replaced uh, the Merchants Exchange. In the background is the City Hall that stood only from uh, about 1860 till it was destroyed in the fire. And then if you go up one, two, three, uh, you can barely see it, but uh, it's just sort of on it, just on the side, you can see the facade of the Sturdivant block, uh, which was uh, designed by, um, uh, by uh, Sparrow about 1865. This is the same view uh, about 10 years later, after the rebuilding. And what we have is now the old post office at the right that took the place of the custom house, uh, a, a new city hall on the site. And then if you go up just one building in from the building on the corner, um, you will see a new Sturdivant block uh, rebuilt after the fire in 1866. And this is the photograph of it today. Uh, and from all that we can gather, um, this building was a virtual duplicate of the building that Sparrow built for the Sturdivant family in 1865, and they liked it so much that, uh, and even though he lost his plans in the fire, uh, he was able to just reconstruct virtually the same building for them. Uh, now we turn to an interesting aspect of Thomas J. Sparrow's practice, one that we don't often think of uh, in, in terms of architects, and that is cemetery monuments. But of course, architects have designed cemetery monuments and tombs all through history. Uh, and some of the great American architects of the 19th and early 20th century uh, did um, tombs. Here we're looking at a very early photograph of the Weston Cemetery. This is probably no later than 1860. The Weston Cemetery was established around 1830 to take care of the overflow of the Eastern Cemetery. And by the time this photograph was taken 30 years later, it itself was overflowing. And already the city had established cemetery in South Portland, Forest City, and Evergreen, uh, what was then out in Westbrook. But here we have this wonderful early photograph from about 1860. And why I'm showing this to you is that one of the prominent monuments in the Western Cemetery, as early as that photograph, and if you look carefully, you can pick it out, but even today with the Western Cemetery, is the monument of Master uh, Henry Jackson. Master Henry Jackson was a school teacher who taught in a little school on the corner of Spring and Oak Streets for 25 years. He was beloved by his pupils. And when he died in 1850, they raised the money to erect the largest monument in Weston Cemetery to him. Now, <laughs> how many teachers can you say of that? <laughs> uh, and it is there today. It's a classical obelisk. Um, with a very nice uh, uh, marble inscription, and then there's a carved inscription as well. And then at the other end of the city, the Eastern Cemetery was still being used into the late 19th century, although sparingly, um, is the monument for uh, a minister. This is the monument of the Reverend William I. Rees in Eastern Cemetery, uh, erected in 1860 from designs by Thomas J. Sparrow. Uh, he is noted as the pastor of the First Universalist Church who founded the Widow's Wood Society. And that was one of these organizations, there were so many of these uh, in the days before the safety net uh, to, uh, to help people who were in need. And this was to provide uh, widows uh, with wood uh, in the winter. Now, Sparrow was involved in um, uh, two, for want of better terms, public buildings in the 1850s, which have some similarities. Uh, the first of these was the Cumberland County Jail. Um, how many of you remember the Cumberland County Jail? Yeah, just a few of us. Uh, it was a very intimidating structure. Um, it was uh, built in uh, 1858, 57-58, um, and this is the first illustration we know of it from uh, William Willis's Handbook of Portland or Guidebook of Portland uh, from 1859. Um, this is based on a sketch and then it becomes a wood engraving. 
But here's the photograph. Very much Italianate in style. Uh, the central part of the, of the structure was a combination of administrative space and also, uh, believe it or not, in those days, in the 19th century, the jailer and his family lived uh, at the jail. Um, and, and so indeed, this, this center uh, brick section with the granite trim uh, was that combination of purposes. And then the actual jail cells were in the wings on either side. Note uh, the, the very elaborate, rusticated, ashlar treatment of these wings in granite with the great elongated windows with the, with the, with the coins, uh, arch coins around them. Very similar to what we'll see uh, in the Mechanics Hall. And of course, the buildings are virtually contemporary. Now, uh, the jail did survive uh, the Great Fire. We're looking from the observatory. Uh, the, the street immediately in the front of us is Congress Street. Uh, the street just over the burned area is Cumberland Avenue. And way down there in the lower right um, on Monroe Street um, is uh, the county jail that just, just barely escaped the fire and, of course, was used for more than 100 years later. Now, when Thomas J. Sparrow uh, was approached in 1857 uh, to design uh, the Mechanics Hall, um, there were already some precedents, some ideas, um, some designs that he might fall back on. And one of them that I think was influential to him was Charles K. Kirby's plan for uh, the new Boston Public Library on Tremont Street. The Kirby brothers, James and Charles, had come from Worcester in the late 1840s and they worked um, uh, in Portland only into the early 1850s, and then went to Boston. And uh, then Kirby got this major commission to do uh, the, uh, the library. And if you look at the arches on the facade, and if you look at the monitored uh, cupola on the top, these are motifs that we find in Mechanics Hall. This is the earliest um, view that we know of of Mechanics Hall. It also appears uh, in Willis's uh, Handbook of Portland, 1859. Uh, again, probably based upon a sketch or maybe upon an early photograph. Um, and, and here we see uh, the building uh, after its immediate completion in 1859 um, with the, the arched windows on the facade, the, um, the wonderful monitor roof that goes the entire length of the roof and the great side arch windows. Here is a more precise, uh, perhaps more architecturally correct, very early wood engraving, which also dates from 1859 and was published in um, Ballou's uh, Pictorial Drawing Room Companion. And so you really get a sense now of the, the elegant granite facade uh, the brick on the side with the arch windows uh, and the monitor roof. And here's a little later view of the building um, from Ed Edward Elwell's uh, Portland and Vicinity from 1876. And already we have uh, Carter Brothers uh, jewelers uh, in the corner, longtime uh, clients of, of that space. This is an interesting photograph uh, showing um, the Congress Street perspective of the building uh, looking from, uh, really from, from uh, west to east, uh, in which uh, all of these small one-story wooden commercial buildings, uh, they're all buildings that are torn down uh, in uh, 1881 uh, for the big J.B. Brown commercial block that is built in 1882-83. But this is the way the street looked, and, and in that uh, case, it's, it really gives you a sense of how Mechanics Hall in its early years just loomed above other buildings. This is a wonderful view pretty early on, probably from around the 1870s. Uh, we're standing in the middle of uh, Congress Street. The front of the hall is in view at the left, those little commercial buildings, some of them are there at the, at the left, uh, and a number of larger commercial buildings have built beyond. The old city hall is there uh, left, right of center with its columns. Here's another 
view. This is a stereo view showing how really striking this building was and the great scale that it had. Um, the other buildings to immediately to the right, the Russell Block, uh, and then the two buildings that were owned by J.B. Brown. And there's a very similar view. And here's a view from the opposite vantage point with the Russell carriage and, and sleigh factory nestled right up next to uh, Mechanics Hall. And here is Carter Brothers uh, with some really quite nifty kind of gothic pointed arch uh, uh, drapes uh, uh, over the windows. Carter Brothers, fine watches, jewelry, silverware, under Mechanics Hall, Congress and Casco Streets, Portland, watches and jewelry carefully repaired. And this was typical of these schemes when large fraternal halls or organizational halls were built to always have commercial space for rental purposes uh, on the first floor to help with the income for maintaining the building. Now, um, just a, a sideline, um, but uh, Mechanics Hall was finished in 1859, and in 1860, another organization, the Portland Athenaeum, builds uh, the first public library in Portland on Union Street, and a little-known architect named Charles Goodell designs that. Uh, it's built in 1860, lasts only six years, destroyed by the fire. Uh, but again, you can see the influence of Mechanics Hall with the arch motif, and particularly the three arch windows and the use of the uh, rustication. Now we're just going to enjoy this building for a few moments. These are photos along with our other contemporary photographs that have been taken by uh, David Clough, and uh, we're very grateful for them. Um, this is the building today at the corner of Congress and Casco Streets, still largely intact from the time that it was completed uh, in 1859. Let me just give you one bit of period flavor here. Can't have a lecture without period flavor. Um, this is from the Eastern Argus of October uh, 23rd, 1857, the cornerstone laying. I'm not going to sing this hymn, but I will read it to you. But it, it, does, it does kind of capture what the mechanics were and still are about. Here a temple let us raise, fitting for thy use and praise. Long honored trinity, labor, art, and charity. Labor, art, charity. Whither sons of toil may turn, resting from uh, this to learn, that of gods they honored be, who in living honor thee. Here may science stay to teach, uh, wisdom utter golden speech, pleasure join with usefulness, love alleviate distress, working out the perfect plan by which all the race of man shall confess thy trinity, labor, art, and charity. Uh, here, here is a, now, of course, a, a view, uh, if you think back a few moments ago, uh, just immediately to the right for most of the history of the building was the Russell Block, and, and now we have the main savings bank plaza. Um, and uh, for those who don't know the story, um, I should probably just, um, sh sh this, is, this is the preservation story uh, in, in, in the talk. Simply that um, I joined the main child mechanics in 1971. Um, I had to wait two or three years. In those days, there was a waiting list, and you had to be, uh, you had to be uh, recommended by someone else who was already a member. At that point, the ceiling was 500 members, and then uh, a year or two later, uh, it was lifted to 600 members. And it was about that time in the early 70s that the Maine Savings Bank wanted to build its great plaza, and they hired a noted architect from the Boston area, Pietro Beluski. And Mr. Beluski came to Portland, and he looked at the site, because there were several old brick Victorian commercial buildings there, and he said, I must have the whole site. I must have the whole block to, to build my building on. And so the bank came to the mechanics, and I remember the meeting, uh, 
And fortunately, reason prevailed, and it, it actually prevailed for very pragmatic reasons. Yes, we were aware of the great history and architecture of this building, but the, 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 the decision not to sell to the bank and not to fall to the pressure of Mr. Belusky was simply that, uh, where would we go? This building has been our home for so long. And this building um, is, is uh, the center of our activities and our identity. What would we be without this building? And so fortunately, the decision was made uh, to reject the offer, and the building is still very much uh, with us today. And there have been other peaks and valleys as well in, in the history of the organization. But always reason has prevailed, and the organization has rose, risen to the occasion. Here's a head-on view. And then these wonderful carvings. Uh, this is the, the arm of labor, or the arm, arm and hammer. It's not the arm, it's not the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the hand, the hand and sickle. It's the whole hand and, and arm and, and hammer. There we go. David's great photograph of this. Even with the sinos in this, in this, uh, arm. And then, uh, to honor two, um, figures from antiquity, uh, carved in the keystones of the facade were Vulcan, uh, the god of fire, and Archimedes, uh, the great ancient mathematician and scientist. And then, over the entrance, mechanics, apostrophe hall. So as we end our story of Thomas J. Sparrow, it is a kind of poignant ending. I've already mentioned that within a year after the Great Fire, he suffered a serious stroke. Um, his, uh, one of his brothers, that was William, had become the superintendent of the slate quarries in uh, Brownville, way up in northern Maine. And this is Brownville <laughs> in about 1870. So it was quite a shock to go from, from Portland to Brownville. Uh, however, and, and there are the quarries that uh, his brother uh, managed. However, uh, his brother had a wonderful house in, in Brownville. Uh, and one wonders if, if Thomas, because this house predated Thomas's stroke, if this might have been a Thomas Sparrow uh, design. In any case, uh, it's a, a sort of combination of Greek Revival and, and Italianate with the little brackets on the cornice, but it is entirely sheathed in slate shingles. And to this day, it is known as the Slate House in Brownville, and it's on the National Register as such. So we end where we began with Thomas J. Sparrow, and hopefully we have a little widened appreciation of his life and his work. I want to do another quick reading as I end from the Eastern Argus, February uh, 1859. This was when the building was being dedicated, a tribute to the architect of the building. We have no need to speak of his praises, we have only to look about us to see them. Now that's very much based upon um, Sir uh, Christopher Wren's epitaph in, in, uh, uh, in St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, we have only to look about him to see, uh, look about us to see them. He has proven that although one swallow cannot make a summer, one sparrow can create um, a, a form of beauty which shall give delight in all times and all seasons. Thank you. And I was intrigued to see that many of the buildings were destroyed in the Great Fire were in fact made of brick and mortar rather than wood. The, the question is that many of the buildings that were destroyed in the fire were built of brick and granite rather than wood. The problem was that the fire um, 
got such a powerful start. It started down at the corner of around high and commercial streets. It hit um, J.B. Brown's Great Sugar Factory, which was eight feet, uh, pardon me, eight, eight stories tall. And it just ignited it like a great, you know, uh, bomb. And so then the, the fire was like a great sheet of fire. And it, it, the, the buildings could not withstand the fire. There was the, the old custom house um, that was built in the 1850s, was supposed to be a fireproof building. It was built of, um, of uh, stone on the outside and a lot of use of cast iron on the inside. And it did withstand, the walls withstood the fire. But when the government architects came to uh, examine it, they said, it's just too badly damaged. We can't, we can't reuse the walls, you know. It was a massive conflagration. Yes. Well, can you comment on some of the historic uses of the building uh, during the Civil War and, and the City Hall? Yeah. Yes. Um, the question is, comment on the historic uses of the building. And, um, of course, one of the most famous chapters is when uh, the the city burns, the great fire, uh, among the buildings as you saw was the, was the city hall that was destroyed. And so um, this became the de facto city hall for uh, until the new city hall was, was reconstituted about 1868. So for a couple years this is where city government was conducted because there were so few large buildings that had survived the fire. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm seeing Herb Adams back there. Uh, Herb, can you tell us the Civil War significance? Uh, the very top of the building that you have referenced as the monitor is where the troops that gathered from Maine by train 24-7 would be marched up from the waterfront to the top and it is there they were fed by, uh, in, in that celestery that is still <laughs> there. Uh, the stove is there. Everything is there except the gas lights. And even the place where the ceiling is patched, where the men marched up the stairs, two in the morning, bearing their muskets, whacked the ceiling. <laughs> the musket barrel marks are still there. Thank you. And for those of you know, who know Herb, Herb, Herb among other things, uh, is a rare uh, orator from the 19th century who, who knows how to project his voice. <laughs> and, and there was nothing that I enjoyed more when I was in my Augusta days of uh, monitoring the legislature than hearing Herb in debate. Uh, no one else really had a chance, Herb. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm interested in the, the process you described where you went from an architect to had to, had to play a role in building the building that he or she designed to the architect as an independent, uh, totally independent from the builder. What did we gain from that transition and what did we lose? Well, I, I, think, I think ultimately we gained because um, the, the, the architectural profession uh, began to develop in that second quarter of the 19th century. And by 1857, we had a national architectural organization, the American Institute of Architects that's still there. Uh, and it was, and then of course that led to professional organization, uh, to professional education. Uh, in the late beginning after the Civil War. And it, uh, granted, it was the development of a specialization, but it also meant that that specialization could rise up the, the quality of what was designed and also uh, be more assured of the, uh, of the stability of what was designed as well. And I think, uh, I think those were, you know, that professionalism was, was uh, a, a gradual but important evolution. Um, uh, and, and, and Sparrow and a few other people were in the cutting edge of that. Yes. Earl, you take a joiner, a wood joiner, and he designs a building like this. What, what did he learn? How did he learn 
get to make this happen without falling down? Well, um, I think what happened, there was a lot of self-education in those days. Um, there, were, there were many books on architecture, on structure, uh, and um, also, you know, one, one learned uh, through apprenticeships and one learned through, uh, through um, reading. And one also learned through observation. I mean, the, the, this was a period where people began to travel. They would go to Boston. They would go to New York. And we don't know. He might actually have had the opportunity to train with someone in Boston or New York. We've just never found that out. Other arch early architects in Maine did. Fassett, who's a well-known architect here in Portland, trained in both uh, Boston and New York in the 1840s. You know, So it, it was a combination probably of many factors, Peter. But um, Ultimately, um, here we are, and the building's still standing. <laughs> yes, John. If I remember correctly, Sparrow died very shortly after the fire. I'm sorry? Uh, Sparrow died very shortly after the fire. Yes. Like the next year? Uh, no, no, he had his stroke. He had his stroke uh, within a year of the fire. 1867, and then he, he went up to live in Brownville with his brother, and then died there in 1870. I'm just wondering, one might speculate to, that this brilliant man saw so many of his creations destroyed in the fire. I'm wondering if that started the demise of his health. Well, I, I, I've, I've often thought the same thing. And also, the other issue may have been, and again, we can only speculate, it's dangerous to speculate, but we can only speculate also that not only the shock of the fire and losing his office, but also the fact that uh, he probably had tremendous pressure upon him to help rebuild the city. And the rest is history. <laughs>